plants. They are in constant motion. They sprout, take root, germinate. You can only see those processes when using time-lapse photography. For instance, the way plants follow the sun or the way some close their petals at night and open them again in the morning. However, there are really fast plants. Meet Mimosa pudica. Don't confuse it with silver wattle, which men traditionally give to women on the 8th of March. Okay, so Mimosa pudica, a herbaceous plant of up to 60 centimeters in height. Even a subtle touch can make its leaves fold and droop. We ask ourselves, are plants capable of fast movements? Are they capable of trapping someone or something? What is the correct way of referring to these plants? Insectivorous or carnivorous? The right term is an insectivorous plant. This term was coined by Charles Darwin. He did a lot of research on these plants and wrote a treatise entitled Insectivorous Plants. However, now a lot of synonyms are used. Some call them predator flowers, predator plants, carnivorous plants. Some refer to them as killer plants to intimidate ordinary people. Either way is acceptable. Pitcher plant. Sundew. Butterwort, Nepenthes, Australian pitcher plant, and the Venus flytrap. Of these, only the last mentioned is very fast and looks the most menacing. The Venus flytrap, as with all the other insectivorous plants, grows in places where the soil is poor in nitrogen, such as swamps. The insects replenish the shortage of nitrogen that the plants require for the synthesis of proteins. When a fly or a mosquito lands on a spiked leaf, they touch the sensitive hairs. The leaves snap together. If a prey is not trapped, it continues to stimulate the hairs, and as a result, the leaves will continue closing. Thus, when the halves fully close, these so-called jaws make a sort of a stomach where digestion takes place. The process usually takes about 10 days. The end result is that an empty exoskeleton is all that is left of the insect. What happens if I place my finger there? Firstly, I wouldn't recommend you do that. It bites harder than it looks. But if we back you up and do it this way, we could try it. In order to understand that it's serious and dangerous, imagine that it is the mouth of a crocodile snapping closed on your hand. The Venus flytrap has the equivalent pressure per square centimeter than that of a crocodile. Okay, fine. So I'm putting my finger there. Ah, hush, hush. Pressure is very subtle. Still, you can feel it. It doesn't feel unpleasant. These teeth looking spikes are soft. The pressure of the lobes is hardly noticeable. You can easily free your finger. What do you think? Should I remove my finger? Well, it takes two days to digest a mosquito and a week to digest a fly. How much time do you have? I'm free till Saturday. Till Saturday? Till Saturday, say in 50 years. Okay, go ahead, remove it. Voila, have a look at what happened when you removed your finger. There's a small gap now. If a trapped insect is still alive, the leaf will squeeze it. And if, say, it was a finger or a speck of dust or a raindrop that went inside, the leaves will snap shut and apply pressure. The pressure will be applied again and it will open in about 12 to 16 hours. Just like that. Other carnivorous plants trap their prey in a less exquisite manner. Insects get glued to their surface or fall into traps filled with liquid. They stay there until they are fully digested. 
We are armed with an endoscope to have a look at one of those traps. Crazy. Awful. Well, plants can be unusual indeed. Why would one want to improve something which is already perfect? And what is there to improve? For example, a watermelon is either sweet and juicy or sour and watery. And it's most strange when people decide to change its shape rather than taste. Square watermelons, or other cubic, their main difference from a regular watermelon is in Wait a second, let's start from the beginning. It all started in Japan, in the Kagawa Prefecture. Traditionally, people cultivated normal round watermelons there. But in the beginning of the 1960s, there were crop failures. The watermelons started deteriorating. The plantation started decreasing in size. Sales reduced. In short, a solution had to be found. Then the head of the Agricultural Association of the Prefecture, Mr. Yamasito, decided that it was time to come up with a novelty. For example, square watermelons. It is unusual. It attracts attention and it fits in the fridge easily. So starting from 1965, Kagawa has become the main and a rather successful supplier of this unusual fruit. How do you explain the success? Was it really convenient or just, wow, how unusual? Well, we did try to fit it in a fridge and it fits perfectly, but its shape is certainly unusual and it attracts attention and surprises people. So people started using it, not only for its taste, but as a decoration too. For example, in a fruit shop and other shop windows in Japan, They grow only 400 cube-shaped watermelons in Japan. They are harvested once a year, in the middle of July. We only import a few dozen of those. And they cost? Well... The rich have their quirks. A little experiment for our program. We'll try to fit a square or a cubic watermelon in the fridge. We place it on the shelf. Voila. It's been proven that it fits perfectly. How did they manage to grow such a perfectly shaped watermelon? There is no secret to it. All watermelons, while small, are placed in steel containers. Then they grow and acquire the shape of the metal cubes. I think a cube made of glass or plastic would do too. But they are less tough. You have to keep an eye on the watermelon, otherwise it will break the mold. The same technology is used to grow heart, rectangular, or Buddha-shaped fruit. This is very popular in Asia. Experiments decided to attempt adjusting the shape of fruit on our own. We want to grow triangular, or it would be correct to say pyramid-shaped Cucumbers? Three weeks of experiments and failures. And here is the result. Naturally grown triangular shaped cucumbers. How would you assess its selling potential? Here, hold it. I'd buy it because it looks nice. You can use it to decorate a salad. The salad will be more unusual and appealing because it's original and it's grown here in Russia. So why do you think things like this are so rare, especially since we managed to create some? Well, I think the answer is very simple. It requires way more work and the risk of failure is high.
plants which do not require water, fertilizer, or any other care. All they need to survive is sunlight. This is a garden in a bottle or an airtight florarium. The plants within this bottle are alive, but they really don't need water. They generate all the water they need on their own. 150 years ago, a man named Ord shipped ferns from India to Europe and similar bottles and glass jars. That's how florariums became popular in Victorian Britain. Why did they do that? So that it would reach its destination? Yes, so that the plants would survive the long sea voyage. How does it work? Due to photosynthesis, a plant receiving sunlight generates oxygen. Water evaporating from the surface of the leaves remains inside the glass jar. The withering leaves turn into fertilizer, thus creating a self-sustaining biosphere. However, there is a caveat. The glass jar accumulates a lot of moisture. That is why only hydrophilus plants can survive in these conditions. Another thing is that those systems, although proven, can't last long. Finally, a plant can also die due to a genetic process. Nothing lasts forever. Plants can shrink in size and may eventually shrink to a size where existence is no longer possible due to a lack of physiological mechanisms within it. There are other secrets. Florariums are produced with a sufficient amount of hydrogel. It acts as a water reserve for long periods of time. Soil, fertilizers, and pesticides are also supplemented with growth inhibitors. They slow down the natural processes in a way slightly preserving the plants. So who would use those plants, and how? I think the new generations might like the idea because there's a very little vegetation left in the cities. So it would be nice to have an illustration of how nature can fully take care of itself right in front of one's eyes, or rather with minimum interference. It would also be good for people allergic to some plants, those who can't grow flowers at home. It is also a good solution for people who have pets who can chew on plants growing in pots. And lastly, it is perfect for scatterbrain. We found the opposite of an airtight florarium, a plant which is in constant need of care. This is the bonsai. So what is the philosophy behind bonsai? What is its purpose? I think the main idea is to have a bit of nature at home for people. For example, in Japan, there is very little space left. Where would a man go who wants to watch and enjoy nature? There's little space left to do so, especially in the cities. So they place a piece of nature in their homes. Bunzai is a miniature tree. In fact, if there is nothing around to compare its size to, then you wouldn't guess the actual size of this tree. We even made a little video to demonstrate the relativity of its size. The size of the tree suggests a number of bonsai rules. For instance, its leaves. A plant may have big leaves, but a bonsai cannot, regardless of how much effort you put into trying to grow them. Bonsai is usually created from coniferous trees. 
evergreen trees and deciduous trees. That is mainly from all trees and bushes which have small leaves or needles that make them appropriate for the compact miniature form of the bonsai. So now you can compare. This is a bonsai tree, and this one is not. It has a thin trunk. That is why you don't get an illusion of a fully grown miniature tree. Those plants are called pre-bonsai. Few years will pass before this bush turns into a miniature tree. Bonsai takes a lot of time to grow, right? How many years does it take before you can refer to a plant as bonsai? If you start from scratch by planting a seed, then it will take 10 years to grow a harmonious tree, which will look beautiful. If you have a free bonsai, then within three to five years, you may have a proper tree. The most important thing is that a bonsai requires a lot of care. It's not just water and go. It needs trimming, pruning, working with wire to make the branches grow in the right direction. There are a lot of tricks of the trade. For example, to make a thick base for the trunk, one branch is grown in the way it is done here. The trunk is enhanced and becomes broader, and the branch is later cut off. The technique used on those branches is called Jin. They are dead wood bonsai techniques. Repotting must occur at intervals dictated by the vigor and the age of each tree. What if you only water it and do nothing else? What will happen to the bonsai? It will turn into a bush. It will grow. Its branches will grow too. They will Thicken the trunk, branches will grow freely, resulting imminently in loss of shape. This is certainly the complete opposite of an enclosed florarium. It is a tree which not only requires constant attention, but also constant professional care, often involving a specialist. Plants, so familiar yet so full of surprises. Those surprises are discreet, hiding in little-known flora peculiarities or invented and implemented by man. We are so used to having an environment of vegetation around us that we only start realizing how much we need it when it's no longer there. This is yet more proof that we are one with nature, even as man constantly tries to create the illusion that he has the power to control it.